It's been 100 years since the immigrants of the old continent established a new democratic nation of New Patria. However, the discovery of a new energy ore called Somnium caused a war that split the nation between the northern city of industry and the southern industry of mining. The South Confederation of Patria greatly outnumbered the North and dominated the nation. A losing battle for the North led the latter nation to use a forbidden technology. White-coated soldiers ready themselves into battle, with each one of them transforming into different beasts. The battlefields ripe with cannon blast and gunshots from the South soldiers, yet the beasts of the North are effortlessly maneuvering through it. Thus, the once impenetrable fortress of the South has become overtaken by these magical beasts. But how did they even come to be? The Northern government created unique super soldiers to turn the war into their favor. These bestial men are known as incarnates, and they can change the tides of the gunpowder-filled battlefield with their sheer strength and varied powers. When you think about it, it's just like Full Metal Alchemist meets Captain America. Or probably in short, X-Men animated version. With a successful encounter against the Southern Nation, the soldiers of the North are now resting in their barracks, while Special Sergeant Hank Henriette and his men are being commended. After their dismissal, Hank and his best friend, Kane, visit Dr. Elaine's tent. Hank asks Elaine for the status of his comrades, and she tells him that she managed to observe very little from their last fight. To cheer her up, Hank assures her that they all believe in her, as much as she does for them. After all, Elaine is the very reason behind the creation of the Incarnates. Unfortunately, their sweet little moment is cut off by Kane, and a flustered Hank makes his way out of the doctor's tent. The three of them have been best friends since they were children, and Elaine still keeps a photo of them on her table. Outside the tent, the Incarnates are celebrating the night away, while the others are mending their battle wounds and resting. The Incarnate named Will shares a locket with a photo of his family. He says that his daughter Shal is running their orphanage all on her own, while he's here for the war. Roy's interested in meeting Shal as he'd like to have a wife and family after the war. Chiming in, Hank mentions that Will's daughter is really someone to look forward to. Of course, the conversation shifts to Hank, since just about everyone knows of his crush on Dr. Elaine. They start teasing him, especially since he's taking too damn long with his confession. With everyone's eyes on him, Captain Constipated awkwardly chucks out that perhaps he'll think about it once the war is over. And thus the squad is left disappointed in his answer, but they only get rowdier when Kane and Elaine join them. Poor Hank has to frantically keep some drunkards in a chokehold, so his secret won't get busted. The Incarnates continue to take over battles against different territories of the South Confederation. They have the advantage, be it in land, water, or even air. The Incarnates come in a brutal variety. Some of them have wings, others are straight-up giant octopuses. They fight, dominate, and celebrate. It was a speedy takeover one rainy afternoon. Both Kane and Hank agreed that their group settled this encounter faster than usual. Suddenly, a shrill cry from one of the soldiers echoed in the area. Incarnate Abby who can transform into a three-headed snake, had just killed three soldiers. With a howl, the venomous Hydra incarnate goes berserk and starts blindly attacking everyone within its reach. The other incarnates run to the site, trying to snap him out of it to no avail. With the beast continuing his rampage, the northern soldiers are left with no choice but to attack. Captain Hank rushes in, ordering the soldiers to cease. When Hank manages to approach Abby, he cries out that this wasn't his doing, it's something else. Abby's clearly devastated by what's happening to him, and he can only beg his captain to stop him, even if he knows in his heart that he isn't moving on his own. Unfortunately, the other soldiers are quick to fire cannons at Abby, and they aren't shying away from shooting him dead if it comes down to it. Finally, Abby stopped, and he reverts back to his human form. It was a shocking turn of events, one that's too much for many of them to process. When Hank orders for a medic, hardly anyone can move. They're too taken aback by what they saw, by what they're continuing to see. Uh, I'm sorry, Abby weakly says, before sliding his hand into his own venomous mouth. He passes away with Hank trying to stop him. It was a swift victory for the North, but it wasn't anything worth celebrating. That evening, Roy stares at his arm, 
wondering if he will end up like Abby. Kane even asked Elaine if there's a possibility that what happened to Abby could happen to him and the rest of the incarnates. But the grieving doctor doesn't have an answer for him. Just like how she didn't have an answer for Abby back then. Before, while she was examining him, Abby admitted that when he was in the battlefield, he started wondering who the real him is. The man or the beast? There were even times when he wondered if there would come a day where he wouldn't be able to turn back. The horrific incident has planted the seeds of doubt in the minds of the incarnates. After all, who's to say that this was just an isolated incident and not a president? The following day, the incarnates have set a pyre for Abby's body. Captain Hank urges his solemn-faced comrades to listen to him. And he minces no words. What happened to Abby could happen to any one of them. But they are not beasts. They are incarnates, and they have their own will and pride. Because of that, Hank calls for an oath that those who lost their souls shall be slain by their own. If something similar ever happens again, they should be the ones to stop it. It is their duty to see everything through, so that all of what their fallen comrades have done for the war will not be for naught. No matter what happens, Hank assures everyone that they'll go through this together. Despite Hank's empowering words, Elaine remains disheartened, and she returns to her tent without a word. She looks through her research, but it just showed the same results. Ineffective and unknown. In her frustration, Elaine casts her files aside. The Incarnates continue moving forward with their mission, but their numbers diminish with each battle conquered. As they prepare to capture the capital as their final mission, Captain Hank shares his gratitude to his comrades. Everyone looks defeated. The war has taken so much from them. Even if they are emerging as the victors, before, their beastly skins were just small spots on their human skin. The winged incarnates had regular arms. The horned ones lost their horns when they were humans. But now, their beastly skins threatened to dominate their human ones. The avian incarnates couldn't remove their wings even post-transformation, and the horns of the others have become permanent additions to their body. Seeing his heartbroken and battered comrades, Hank forgoes his militaristic speech and instead, he tells them that after the war, he'll ask Elaine to be with him. It wasn't a grand promise of a hero's victory. It was just a simple human longing. But it was enough to move the incarnates, lighting up a certain hope within them. The hope of coming back alive. <laughs> In the captain's tent, Kane tells Hank to rest easy. But how can he when they are about to face their most intense battle yet? This final battle will decide their future on the ongoing war. Kane encourages his friend that all this was possible because Hank was their captain. Hank, in turn, says that all this is because of everyone. Now reminiscing about their childhood, Hank asks Kane who would have thought that war orphans like them could become best friends with a rich boy like him. Kane is amused by this, but he takes on a more serious expression as he tells Hank to take good care of Elaine since she's trying to deal with everything on her own and it's crushing her. Further in the evening, Elaine talks privately with Hank. She informs him that the war will be over soon and their operation will be called off. The headquarters had been moving with top secret ceasefire negotiations and the draft for a peace treaty is already complete. It is then revealed that the North and the South will be one again. Though he's shocked, Hank is relieved that peace is already on the horizon. So it was all worth it? The loss? The grief? The bloodshed? Those bloody roads still led to peace after all? But then, Elaine tells him that they have no place in such peace. Tearful, she makes a sharp turn, points her gun at Hank, and pulls the trigger. The bullet hits him, and the captain finds himself unable to move. It's a brutal and heart-wrenching decision, but it had to be done. Elaine explains that humanity within the incarnates will eventually be lost, and this includes Hank's. She wants to keep this from happening, but she can't find a cure. If and when the incarnates lose their minds, they'll be an even bigger threat to humankind than the war. And since she was the one who created the incarnates, she sees it as her duty to stop them before that happens. Elaine embraces Hank, promising him she'll join him soon. Kane appears behind them, and she pulls away from Hank to approach him. She apologizes for roping him into this. But as she's talking about their plans of wiping out the Incarnates and ending their own lives after, Kane disagrees. As Elaine reloads her gun, 
Kane points his at her, and Elaine falls down right before Hank. The night passes with an unmoving Elaine and a very weakened Hank. In the deep stillness of the hour, only Kane's maniacal laughter disturbs its silence. Two months later, Hank wakes up and finds himself in a military hospital. By the door, 2nd Lieutenant Liza Runecastle introduces herself to Hank and tells him that she works for the Patria Union's military intelligence. With Hank finally waking up from his coma, Liza informs him that the war is long over. The news jolts the incarnate fully awake, and he demands to know what happened to his squad. To Elaine. Well, that's why Liza's there. She wants to know too. The day they found Hank on the verge of death, Elaine disappeared. She's been missing since then, and the incarnates have disbanded. Some followed under the leadership of Kane Madhouse, Hank's very best friend. But eventually, the incarnates lost their rationality and wreaked havoc wherever they went. Hank asked Liza where Kane is, but they couldn't find his location after losing contact with him. Hank grits his teeth and clenches his hand. In anger, he slams his fist against the wall, causing an enormous impact. Those who have lost their souls shall be slain by their own. To fulfill his oath to himself and the Incarnates, Hank makes it his mission to hunt down his former comrades. Before we go any further, let's rewind a little bit. Before being called to war, Will Bancroft and his daughter Shal were the ones managing their orphanage. Shal calls everyone for their usual afternoon tea. As the children start drinking, they comment on how their tea doesn't taste the same. Shal apologizes and tells them that they need to drink tea sparingly. The girl next to her asks why they always have to have tea every day, and Shal explains that their tea time brings them all together. Whether they're feeling happy or sad, tea helps with their emotions. Will adds that it is essential to remember to relax. Later, Will and Shal travel to town to restock food. Unfortunately, their prices have gone up because of the ongoing war. Living's always been hard, but war only makes it harder, even for those who aren't in the battlefield. Traveling back to the orphanage, Shaw wonders if what they gathered would be enough for a month. Will reassures his daughter that they will find a way and figures that it is time for her to learn hunting. Deep into the forest, a deer is perfectly within the range of Shaw's aim. Will and the rest of the children are all waiting for Shaw to make a shot. Unfortunately, Shaw grows hesitant and with the deer sensing their presence, it escapes. What was supposed to be Vention turned into mushrooms for dinner, and this upsets Shaw. Will tries to comfort her as her hesitation is understandable. Hunting means taking another living creature's life, and it's not as simple as it sounds. But Shaw is still dismayed because of the ongoing war and the possibility of running out of food. Will gives his daughter a head pad and tells her he believes in her because she is a strong girl. One day, Shaw will pull the trigger with no hesitation. Returning to the Bancroft Orphanage, a group of soldiers is waiting at the entrance to speak with Will. Their conversation takes a long while, but eventually, Will enters the dining room, where the children have already eaten their dinner. Sipping his tea, Will announces that he's called to war and his departure will be next week. At first, there's shock, but when the shock passes, all that's left is Shawl in anger, fixation. She slams her hands against the table, confused as to why the hell her father will fight in the war when he isn't a blasted soldier. To this, Will tries to explain that the town and their orphanage will be funded if he accepts. Shawl will no longer have to worry about running out of food, and the children will be able to have their fill. It's all promising. A glimpse at comfort even. But Shal objects to this. She and the children would rather have their father with them. But with his daughter refusing to accept the situation, Will cups her face and continues to explain himself. He isn't just in it for the money. Helping with the war means securing peace that will benefit everyone in the future. To him, this is the trigger to pull. The following day, Will prepares for his departure. The villagers reassure Will that they will take good care of his children. And in turn, Will promises that he will end the war. Shaw approaches her father and leaves him a locket with a picture of them and the rest of the children. She puts on her brave face and hopes to see him soon. With the passing of time, the war is finally over, and Will returns. But he isn't the Will they know, the Will they can recognize. 
instead of Special Private John William Bancroft. The villagers see a gigantic dragon beast before them. But it's still him. Still Will. When he lifts a finger to give his daughter a pat on the shoulder, Shaw realizes that it's him. She softens as she finally welcomes her father home. The other children do the same, and it's almost like how things used to be. Will surrounded by his daughter and all of his other children. Time passes, and Will has adequately adjusted to his civilian life. Despite being in his beast form, he can help with the Bancroft's daily routine. Incarnates will have no place in this piece. One afternoon, while Shaw is retrieving their food supply, the villagers ask if she's alright as she has nothing but the government's funding to depend on. Seeing her saddened expression, the villager assures her that they'll try to show their gratitude for what Will has done for the war. That night, Shaw is computing for the daily expenses of the household, and things continue to look grim. It seems that the best thing to do is to cut more of their expenses, including tea. Suddenly, there is a sound of a chilling roar that alarms the whole town. The howl came from her father, and Shaw's worries intensify as she gazes upon Will's eyes. The villagers all appear before the Bancroft orphanage to complain that more of their cows have been killed. They have been suspecting Will for quite some time now, since he has been howling for many nights, and they are all well aware of how little their food supply is nowadays. While they're grateful for Will's contributions, they can't help but be suspicious to act for the collective safety. As such, the entire town has collectively agreed to chain the beast down. This doesn't bode well with Shaw, and she vehemently argues that her father is still human. In turn, one of the villagers clarifies that chaining Will up might help their case in proving his innocence. That's not all though, they even decided to take the children away from the Bancrofts for the little one's safety. It's a terrible thing. Her father left as a good man and came home a monster. Though everyone knows by now that it's Will, it seems that he has never stopped being a monster in their eyes. Life was always hard, but at least Shala had her father and the children. When her father left, she had the kids. But now, it's beginning to look and feel like she has no one to walk through this thorny path with. Her heart breaks, but Shala is left with no choice but to agree. Now that she's all alone, Shal ask Will if they can just move somewhere and start all over again. Her father doesn't respond and simply goes further into the forest. The rain is pouring hard that evening, and deeper into the forest, an explosion is seen. Surprised and perhaps worried, Shal runs out to check. There, she witnesses the tragic sight of her fallen father, at the mercy of a man in a white uniform. Shal calls out to Will, but it's already too late. He can only give his daughter one last look as he falls powerless to his assailant's claim upon his life. Though the man appears hesitant, he still cocks his pistol and shoots. Shaw is left in utter disbelief. Her world seemed to break and collapse right before her eyes, and the only thing she could do was approach it. Approach her dying father slowly. Will had told her that she's a strong girl, but Shaw can only be strong for so long. She breaks down as she keeps calling out to Will, begging him to stay. No matter how much Shaw cried and begged that night, time marched on, and it took her to her father's tombstone. As Shaw stands before it, she thinks about her last moments with Will. Her grief runs cold, making way for unabashed anger as she remembers the man in white. She has so much rage, so many questions, and all she has to show for them is her rifle and the indomitable will to avenge her father. Shaw leaves the orphanage to hunt Will's killer. In her search, Shaw travels to different towns, hoping to find any leads on the white-coated man's whereabouts. But just as she's about to lose hope, she finally sees the man, her father's killer in a tavern. Without a second to waste, she equips her rifle and shoots him. The bullet hits his chest, but the man just walks as if nothing happened. He then rushes the Shaw and carries her off to the nearby alley. The man demands to know who she is, and Shaw promptly reveals that she is Will's daughter. This was the moment that Shaw's been waiting for. She pulled the trigger. But this only left her with more questions than it did a shred of resolution. How is he still alive? To this, the man explains that her bullet is just not enough to kill him. Suddenly, they hear the voices of the townsfolk exclaiming that a certain Danny is back. 
their voices are laced with fear as they rush to hide the children. This catches the man's attention, and he starts walking to the town proper, with Shaw demanding to know who the Danny is. The man simply responds that he is an incarnate, much like her father, and much like him. This stuns Shaw, but when he tells her to stay put if she wants to live, she refuses to and instead follows him. Stood before the townsfolk is the hulking mammoth of a man named Danny. He has a gentle smile as he addresses everyone, particularly his mother. Everyone's wary of him, but he doesn't seem to notice. He excitedly shows them their haul, which is a bloody bag full of jewelry and coins. Danny tells everyone that if they sell these, then the town will surely prosper. Though everyone is perturbed by this, his uneasy mother still thanks him. Their conversation is interrupted when the man begins to approach, bearing news about how several wagons have been attacked and slain on the roadside. He asks Danny if he did it before taking off his hood, revealing that he is their captain Hank. Danny is shocked to see him, and Hank asks if he still remembers the oath they took that day. Those who have lost their souls shall be slain by their own. With a saddened look, Danny can only call out to his captain while Hank readies his weapon. But before he could make a move, Shaw steps in between them, asking if he's going to kill Danny like he killed her father. She then demands to know if Hank actually saw him attack the wagons, but while she's defending him, Danny starts losing control of himself. He asks them nicely for their stuff, Danny claims, as he begins to transform. Because that way, everyone in town would be happy. But they wouldn't, and that's why he killed them. Hank immediately pushes Shaw out of the way, and Danny starts bashing his colossal fist into the ground, breaking it, yelling about how he's going to make his mother well off, how he's going to make everyone in town happy. Meanwhile, his mother is crying, despairing over what went wrong, while the villagers can only tell her that there's no stopping her son now. She can't help him. With rage consuming his already broken mind, Danny asserts that he'll destroy everyone who gets in his way, even his captain. The two incarnates battle each other, but while Danny's a proper juggernaut, Hank still outclasses him and he quickly subdues his comrade. With a special bullet in his pistol, Hank is once again aiming at a fellow incarnate, and another soldier he led and guided in the war. He can't help but think back to how kind Danny was. How this young man, no, how this boy, just wanted to help his town prosper. He smiled so brightly back then, just thinking about all the ways he could help his town. One that was so poor that they could barely afford to drink coffee. And like Will Bancroft, Danny joined the war so everyone could live a better life. With one last look at his crying mother, Danny weakly asked his captain if it would have been better if they died as gods on the battlefield. Hank is pained by this question pained by the prospect of taking the life of yet another one of his comrades. But he pushes through. He solemnly apologizes before shooting, leaving Danny's mother to cry and rush to her dead son. After doing the deed, Hank walks away, leaving Shaw to stop him and hold him at gunpoint. She angrily questions if he's going to keep hunting down his own men, and Hank simply says that it's because of the oath they swore. Shaw retaliates that the war is over, but Hank answers that it's not over. None of it is. They never got to finish it. His answer only left the child with more questions, and she yells out that he killed her father before she could know more about the incarnates. She keeps asking him what happened, but Hank isn't responding to her at all. Unfortunately for him, Shaw is nothing if not persistent. If he won't tell her, then she'll come with him, so she'll see with her very own eyes why her father had to die. The war may be over for many people, but to those who live through it, it becomes an extension of themselves that they unwittingly haul back into their homes. So while war never changes, people do. Shaw and Hank saw that with their own eyes. The two of them stand on opposite ends of the spectrums, as Hank knows all too well why they need to be eliminated, while Shaw can't seem to understand why. But despite their differences, they're both victims to the tragedy of conflict and necessity. They have a painful and bloody road ahead, but perhaps it's one they can traverse together. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. 
and leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.